Foiled, embrace the twisted weirdness of Freak Show Cinema! It's interesting to think the Addams Family, the dark, twisted, morbid, disturbed, pretty much any depressing word you can think of, has more family-friendly representations than non-family friendly. They have two sitcoms, two children's comedies, an animated kids series, two if you count Scooby-Doo. Spoiler, they all did in that one. Several video games, and lots of kid-friendly merchandise. Like many, I was introduced to them through the 60s show, and I really enjoyed it. But more importantly, it introduced me to the original source material, the Charles Addams cartoons. Published in the New Yorker around the 30s, his cartoons were like many of the New Yorker cartoons, very adult, and sometimes took a second to figure out. But he had two things that helped him stick out. One, they were gothic as hell. Half the time you had to go looking for the joke, and doing so allowed you to take in these beautifully dreary worlds. The second was these reoccurring characters, who at the time didn't have names, but they seemed to represent the traditional nuclear family, just in a world of horror and darkness. It was the traditional happy family doing things that wouldn't make a traditional happy family happy. There was a feeling that anything surreal or even magical could happen as long as it had a dark bite to it. It was a great contrast that made for a great show, but like I said, it was a family-friendly show. It wasn't as gritty or adult as the comic because it wasn't allowed to be as gritty or adult as the comic back then. Thankfully, another fan of the comic was Barry Sonnenfeld who made a name as an astounding cinematographer but had never directed a film before. He was handed the script to the Addams Family, which he said was terrible, and asked why it wasn't given to someone like Tim Burton or Terry Gilliam. The producer said they said it was terrible, and passed. Which, if you've seen some of the scripts they said yes to, that's saying something. The producer insisted on Barry because he really liked the Addams Family and said if he wasn't going to get a big-time weirdo to make it, he wanted someone that was going to take chances and break the rules because he didn't know all the rules yet. Barry agreed, insisted on a rewrite, and we got, in my opinion, the most faithful interpretation of those dark as hell cartoons. The first sign this was going to be the best interpretation of the material was the trailer. Not the teaser, which was cute and again was taken from the Charles Adams strip, but the longer version that starts out like a horror film. And let's be honest, some of the imagery from this could be. It was also accompanied by something very unexpected for a film like this, a PG-13 rating. Now keep in mind, this is before PG-13 just meant Thor says two dirty words or someone is implied killed off screen. This is hearts can be ripped out and monkey brains can be eaten PG-13. This is when kid show adaptations could have their main character swear up a storm. Damn! But what makes the film so great is that it's a perfect blending of the TV show and the Charles Adams cartoons. Yes, the characters are pretty similar. For the most part, we'll get to that. And those classic corny one-liners slip their way in. Dang, you're a handful. But so much of the focus was on the atmosphere. Much like the comic, you could get lost in the beauty and life that steams from the ugly and dead. So much so that the jokes would sometimes be in the background, allowing you to discover them while you're getting lost in the scenery. Many of the jokes were even taken straight from the drawings. Now, the difference between these PG-13 jokes and, say, the PG jokes of the family-friendly Adams Family properties is that it goes that one step further. Ah, miss! The best example I can give is those old Warner Brothers cartoons. You see characters get squashed by anvils and other heavy objects and they turn out fine. But when they off themselves, that seems a lot darker. Either way, the character still comes back for further shenanigans, but the connection to something more gruesome suddenly brings a more recognizable misery to the joke. But it's that kind of humor that gives the film its needed edge. The characters always survive, but what they go through is recognizably gruesome. This imagery is so zanily abstract, it's absurd. Where this is so realistically grim, it's unnerving. <laughs> And PG-13 Adams, like the original cartoons, isn't afraid to push the envelope. It's a way of saying it's all miserable and terrible, but by recognizing it and even embracing it, you can live with it. Maybe even find a positive way to look at it. Which is why the darker the Adams family goes, not only the more funny it gets, but in a strange way, the more inspiring it gets. Like I said, the joke is that they enjoy things that people would find macabre. And by having all the family enjoy it so much, they enjoy being around each other. Which, ironically, makes them a very healthy family. 
Their version of poisoning or chopping up one another is our version of unconventional play, because they always survive and ask for more. Even when they fight, they still love each other and come together as a family in the end. The great thing is, they don't even have to have any sappy full house music or verbal declaration of that. It's just naturally shown in how they treat each other. Well, in the realms of this fantasy world where you can survive a lot. Their love for each other doesn't need to be said. It's naturally shown. My own dear brother. <laughs> At the center is the actors who are all wonderfully cast and bring the perfect amount of bombastic joy or quiet content even if the story is, admittedly, a little dumb. It centers around the family, led by Raul Julia as Gomez and Angelica Houston as Morticia, searching for Gomez's long-lost brother, Fester. To try and rob them blind, their accountant sends in a look-alike, played by Christopher Lloyd, to pretend to be Fester and, wouldn't you know it, by the end it turns out to really be him with amnesia. Yeah, pretty stupid. But the reasons it works is you legit feel the emotions all these characters have for each other. It does kinda make sense a psychopath would find himself fitting into this family. Cyanide, Fester. As if we'd run out. And even the Adams mock a bit how absurd it is. How true. Stranger things have happened. If you can believe it, there was a version of the script where this was just an imposter and Fester is never found. But they grew to love him so much they accept him as a member of the family. Apparently the cast was so horrified by this that they banded together and said it has to end with him being the real brother. They even insisted that Christina Ricci, who played Wednesday, tell them of their disgust to show how serious they were. Not sure why having a 10 year old say that shows how legit you are, but I guess the story was going to be forced and convoluted anyway, so might as well go all the way with it. But even with such a lame premise, everybody was committed to it and audiences ate it up. Adam's Family was one of the highest grossing films of 1991, and even broke a long dry spell of underperforming films at the box office, making Barry Sonnenfeld an overnight name. It's no surprise that only two years later a sequel was made. Hey, that's pretty short compared to the Harry Potter schedule. Was it stronger than the first, or weaker? Um, somehow both. I'll tell you after this. With the same team returning to work on the sequel, Adam's Family Values picks up where the last storyline left off, with Morticia giving birth. In the most Morticia way. Push, Mrs. Adams! <laughs> Almost from the beginning, the film wants to assure you it still has the same edge. As some sequels back then were being watered down for a much more kid-friendly audience. They pretty much spit in the face of that right away as Wednesday and Pugsley listen to a girl explain how babies are born from the Cabbage Patch and the diamond turned into a baby. Our parents are having a baby, too. They had sex. Let's see him put that in the new movies. So where the film does much better is in its writing. Make no mistake, the writing in the first one turned out great, but the story was pretty forced. Here, the story is much funnier and matches what the Adams would see as a threat. In three plots, no less. There's one plot about a nanny named Debbie, played hilariously by Joan Cusack. If you're like me to this day, you can't hear her name without thinking. Malibu Barbie. She wants to marry Fester and kill him to get his fortune. An old routine, but it leads to some great character moments, as she has to work her way into the family's good side, which is pretty easy seeing how she's also a psychopath. I just want to grab them and squeeze them till there's not a breath left in their tiny little bodies. <laughs> Another plot involves her sending the kids to summer camp because they're getting too close to her plans, where Wednesday falls in love, kind of, to a boy played by David Krumholtz. Many say the best laughs in the movie are here, and I really can't disagree, as seeing them interact off the sunny and upbeat crowd and how it slowly suffocates them is pretty damn hilarious. How long do we have to stay in here until we crack? Also, the wonderfully sadistic camp counselors, played by the great Peter McNichol and just as great Krinstein Baraski, are fantastic to watch as they try to be patient with their chipper mood, but find themselves cracking every once in a while. Don't we just hate that? Yes! Don't we wish they would just die? Yes! Oh, no, we don't! Oh, there are also, like, a million flavors of prejudice leading to a recital that I'm sure I don't have to play any clips from because it always makes the rounds every Thanksgiving. Eh, screw it, here's a few anyway. You have taken the land which is rightfully ours. My people will have pain and degradation. Your people will have stick shifts. God, that's so good. The third plot involves the baby becoming sick, which to them is the equivalent of looking like the loveliest baby alive. Oh no. He lives. 
Even though this is all still far-fetched, the stories feed into each other and move the film forward, creating more relatable problems that families deal with. Splitting up, not getting enough time with someone, not fitting in, young love, not liking a new family member, not liking two family members, them not liking you back. And sure, I guess some families have someone marrying for other motives, but you get the idea. These are more family-centered problems that people can identify with. And once again, at the heart of it is that you can do or say whatever you want to them, but at the end of the day, you break up family? That's where they draw the line. That's when they start to get weak. You have placed Vester under some strange sexual spell. I respect that. But please, may we see him? Again, for such demented movies? It's kinda sweet. Fester is allowed to act a lot more like Fester this time, as in the last film he had amnesia and was technically playing an imposter. So it's fun to see Lloyd go much more into the traditional nutball role. My name is Fester. It means to rot. I'll admit I like the aunt in the other film a bit more because she felt like a real aunt, where Carol Kane seems more focused on making the joke work. With that said, she does always make the joke work. Nixel, burst and burn! What is she doing? Just to curse. Have a nice day. I also feel a little sorry for Pugsley, played by Jimmy Workman, because I feel like he really got sidelined for Wednesday. I think the team just didn't know what to do with him, where Richie just stole the show playing Wednesday. So they clearly liked writing for her more. With that said, when he does have a scene, he makes it count. When you have a new baby, one of the other children has to die. Which one? They only need one boy. In fact, I think the Girl Scout from the previous film gets more screen time than him. Mercedes McNabb returns as Amanda Buckman, who I guess was so satisfyingly smug in her bit role in the first movie, they made her one of the villains. And it's a huge compliment to say it's hard to figure out which villain is better, her or Joan Cusack. They are both so hilarious and so psychotic in their own unique ways. Why are you dressed like somebody died? Wait. So, okay, the jokes and story are better, so the film should be better, right? Not entirely. As great as this is, there is one major element missing. The atmosphere. No, oh, it's there, still plenty of dreary sets and gothic art design, but much like another Sonnenfeld sequel, Men in Black 2, the environment takes a back seat to the jokes. And something is missing when that's done. With the exception of maybe Fester howling at the moon in the opening, every scene has to have a big laugh in it. And yeah, it's a comedy, that should go without saying, but that's not always how the first film worked. There's many scenes where the characters are just being themselves in a surreal and fantastical world, and that was enough. Again, like the comics, sometimes just letting you breathe in this world, or maybe even die in this world, <laughs> gave you a sense of really being there. Look at this scene where they say they're gonna throw Fester a party. A party? For me? Here. Yeah. There's no big laughs to it, but it's so grand and gothic and dripping with the family's culture that it somehow adds a lot of weight to it. If the characters weren't well defined, these scenes wouldn't work, but they are. And we like just being with them in this world. In the sequel, we just like being with them. But to be fair, that is kind of enough. In the original, Gomez and Morticia could just dance and that was satisfying. Here, there has to be several jokes going on. It does make sense, it's a follow-up, they want to up the ante, but something is missing when you're focusing a little too much on the writing and not enough on living in the world you created. Oh, yeah, I kind of forgot to mention, there's rap songs in these. I wanted to bring this up because I guess Snoop Dogg voiced Cousin It in the newer films and, of course, did a rap as him. Because, you know, they like scaring us in as many ways as possible. You know I never left, that's how I brought it back. But what I want to know is what I want to at. I want to show they could be worked in okay. On top of the MC Hammer song in the end credits, which I can't help but have a soft spot for, there is something funny about having them listen to rap music. It almost seems contradictory for their style, but that's almost what makes sense about it. Everything is contradictory to them. Even Cousin It is listening to Too Legit To Quit in his car. Back then, that made me laugh so hard because I just love knowing he was an MC Hammer fan. That was so bizarre. Him suddenly changing his voice and rapping out of nowhere? Not as much. Also, you gotta love the laziness of switching out Whoop, There It Is with Whoop, The Addams Family, There It Is. 
care what anyone says, it doesn't beat their masterpiece. Oh, please feel free to Google that to see if I'm lying. <laughs> I guess I wanted to show there's always been elements of the mainstream in Adam's family that have since become dated, but it still doesn't take away from it. It shows more what a time capsule some parts can be, but the majority of it still keeps true to what it is. No part of it feels like it's cheating us out of what the original style was. Like, wanna get the party started, plug and wear. Yeah, you know the drill by this point. With that said, I've seen very little of the Adams Family follow-ups after this. I never checked out the straight-to-video Adams Family reunion. And yes, I do mean video, as there's no DVD release of it. I guess it's that good. I will admit, though, Tim Curry was the perfect choice to replace Raul Julia at that point in time. I saw a little bit of the series reboot and honestly thought it captured parts of the original show pretty well. That's odd. No, that's Cousin It. That's Cousin Odd. I didn't care too much for the Saturday morning cartoon. Ironically, a little too colorful for me. Maybe if it was in black and white, I don't know. And yeah, I've only seen clips of the animated films and... I like it like that. Oh, I see, I see. Baby. They just don't look like my thing. For me, it's the Charles Adams cartoons or the Sonnenfeld films, because they weren't afraid to be a little meaner, but somehow joyful in their meanness. There's an understanding that life can be very depressing and very dark. It's a part of life we shouldn't always be afraid of, and there is something strangely encouraging about seeing characters who aren't. Yes, it's in a fictional world, and we shouldn't literally do the things that they do because we wouldn't survive them. But their attitude and optimistic demeanor to the scarier side of things is what ultimately draws us to them. That's why I think the more dark it is, the better it is. It is ironic that Burton turned down this movie only decades later to do a different Adams Family project. I guess we'll see how that turns out. All I can say is, if they capture even a fragment of the creepy, kooky, and mysteriously gooky that these films did, I think we'll be in good hands. Either way, we'll still have these movies to visit the Adams anytime we want. I'm a nostalgia critic guy, remember? So you don't have to. Malibu Barbie. What's up, everybody? Our cameos for charity are still doing great, and so we're gonna switch it up this month. All through June, we're donating our cameo money to Friends of Firefighters. Friends of Firefighters is a not-for-profit organization that provides independent, confidential, and free mental health counseling and wellness services to active and retired New York firefighters as well as their family members. So if you want a cameo from me as the Nostalgia Critic saying happy birthday or congrats or whatever you can think of, click the link below and be supporting a wonderful charity. And even if you're like, screw you, I don't want a cameo from you, well, spread the word about this charity anyway. Check out the site, donate, or share it on social media. Thanks so much again, and take care.